Hey, this is Joshua from the church at Mon River. Thanks for taking time to listen to this teaching. We have one purpose here, and that is to make followers of Jesus. And we hope that this recording helps accomplish this purpose in your life. Um, and we're going to be 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, until the end of the chapter. All right. When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though the Lord opened a door for me, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find my brother Titus. Instead, I said goodbye to them and left for Macedonia. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in Christ's triumphal procession and through us spreads the aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For to God we are the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To some we are an aroma of death leading to death, but to others an aroma of life leading to life. Who is adequate for these things? For we do not market the word of God for profit like so many. On the contrary, we speak with sincerity in Christ as from God and before God. Church, this is the word of the Lord. We are regularly using the phrase followers of Jesus. And uh, I want you to consider this morning, if you were engaging with someone in the workplace or someone uh, at the, in your neighborhood or maybe in the classroom, and they were to ask you, what do you mean by follower of Jesus? Now, what kind of language would you use to describe the Christian life to that person? Would that language mostly be positive language or negative language? Now, for us in starting this church, uh, from the very beginning, it's been our hopes that uh, we primarily grow through people uh, coming to faith in Jesus Christ, becoming a follower of Jesus. And as we are going out into the world and, and convincing people that following Jesus is best for them as an individual and, and best for their families and best for the community around us, I hope certainly that we are using positive language, right? That positive language is going to be much more convincing than uh, just telling them how hard things are going to be. And we're telling people the good news of Jesus, right? But if you think about our daily lives as followers of Jesus, if we are only telling people positive things, and we're also not being honest. There are things in the Christian life that are hard. There's times of suffering, there's times of persecution. Following Jesus costs us something in our lives. So how do we strike this balance in our communication with people? Telling them that following Jesus is the greatest decision that they will ever make. It's also an extremely costly decision. How do we explain to people that the following Jesus will, will bring to them the greatest benefit that they can ever receive? Also bring suffering and hardship into their life. How do we strike this balance of positive and, and negative in our communication with the world? Today, as we look in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we see Paul talking uh, with two different word pictures about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. One word picture that he uses is that of a victory parade. He calls it a, a triumphal procession. The other word picture that Paul gives us is one of, of a smell, a fragrance that's dripping through the air. As we look at these two word pictures that Paul gives us in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, the main point that I have for us today is that following Jesus brings triumph and defeat, attraction and repulsion. Following Jesus brings triumph and defeat, attraction and repulsion. And I hope that as we go through this lesson today, that uh, you leave this place, uh, one, both encouraged in your faith, inspired to go out and and make a difference for the kingdom of heaven. To also leave this place equipped to handle the hard parts of the Christian life. And we see as Paul begins his letter in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, just reflecting on the last several weeks, he, he dives right into some difficult subject matter. He addresses some of the hard parts of his ministry. Talked uh, in our first week on the study in chapter 1, verses 3 through 11, about how 
Paul recounts his sufferings. He uses the term afflictions that he's had while he's been doing ministry. Talks there about how his sufferings had the purpose of bringing godliness in their lives. In chapter 1, verse 15 through chapter 2, verse 4, Paul reflects on the tensions that he's had between him and the church at Corinth, this church that he founded. He talked there about how he, he defends why he made some change of plans, and, and he defends his ministry to the church. Chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, uh, Paul thinks back uh, on the first letter that he wrote to the church at Corinth. Now he called out this man who was living a very immoral life, public for everyone to see. He talked in that section there about how this man should be restored in the spirit of forgiveness and restoration. We're not going to get into this a lot, but in the verses that Angela read previously in chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, Paul reflects on his most recent, recent missionary travels. How he went to this town called Troas, and there was an opportunity for him there to share the gospel with those living there. It was an open door. But when he arrived, he had no peace in his spirit. He hadn't heard back from Titus about how the church at Corinth had received the difficult letters that he had written to them. And so with all of this difficulty as the context, Paul now makes a very positive shift. Look at what he writes in Chapter 2, verse 14, he says, But thanks be to God. All this difficulty in mind, thanks be to God, who always leads us in Christ's triumphal procession. There we see this first word picture of Christ's triumphal procession. Church at Corinth, there in the first century, when they would have heard this phrase, triumphal procession, they would have immediately thought about the Roman victory parades. Great parades in Rome where they would celebrate their military successes. This week as I was studying, I read that in Roman history books, they record some 350 different victory parades. Where the armies in their um, glory would return from battle. These triumphal processions are recorded in in um, uh, coins that they would uh, hand out, or in statues, or, or the architecture that the Romans would have. Also in their paintings, this was a painting that I found this week from the 1600s. It's known as Vespian's Triumphal Entry in Rome. This would be a time of very great celebration. Rome would withhold no expenses in celebrating their war campaigns. The crowds would line the streets and, and throw flowers. The parade goers walk by. They would be cheering and burning incense to their gods. The military leaders would be riding in on, on these great horses and chariots, followed by their soldiers and the army walking behind them. There was a different part of this parade one that you might not notice at first glance in this picture. But I learned this week that also in this parade was this other group that you might see right here. The Romans were known for capturing the greatest warriors of their enemies or the, the leaders of uh, the other nations. You see the crowns that the people behind them are holding. And they would take these enemies that they captured and they would parade them through the streets. They would eventually lead them to the square of their city and they would publicly execute these prisoners of war. And just think about the contrasting images that you see right here before you in this painting. On one side is the, the general of the winning army. Everyone's celebrating them for their successes. And on the other end are these Prisoners of war, the, the generals of the other army, walking through town in utter defeat. Listen, church, 
There's no doubt in the Bible that Jesus wins. The book of Revelation describes clearly his victory. That he is crowned as king. And he's praised by every creature on heaven and on earth. Those who follow him will join him in his victorious kingdom. If you think back to the life of Jesus here on this earth, it's mostly defined not by victory, praise, but by suffering. Culminated in the lamb being led to his slaughter, as it says in Isaiah 53. Jesus giving his life as a ransom for ours. Him purchasing our forgiveness by his death. And here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, when Paul writes this phrase that he is being led in Christ's triumphal procession, it's not language that's describing celebration and him receiving praise and walking as a captain following after Jesus. Really like how the New Living Translation describes this. This is how it writes. It says, But thanks be to God, He has made us His captives and continues to lead us along in Christ's triumphal procession. And this interpretation of the text, it makes sense in the context of 2 Corinthians, where Paul is reflecting on his suffering as a follower of Jesus. He's thinking back to his afflictions. He's thinking on his conflicts with his church. He's thinking about the unrest in his spirit over the church. And he thanks God that he is following after Jesus as a captive in the victory array. You think back to Paul's life. He was pursuing his own way as an enemy of Jesus. He was a persecutor of Christians. And then he encountered the risen Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. And Paul himself was defeated. From that point forward, he regularly refers to himself as a slave of Christ. He is paraded through the world as one who has died to himself. And the crazy thing is, Paul is thanking God for this reality. Why? Well, he explains in the second part of verse 14. He says that this act of, of him being paraded as a captive, it does this. It says, it spreads the aroma of the knowledge of Christ in every place. Think about it. Paul's sufferings is spreading the aroma of the knowledge of Christ to everyone who is watching this victory parade. All to the glory of God is capital. And listen, this idea it was contrary to what the church at Corinth was expecting. They wanted Christian leaders who were impressive who had great stature and great speech. We would we'll see as we continue to go through the book of 2 Corinthians that there are some who rejected Paul's apostleship because he lived a life of suffering. And Paul is telling us, he says, this suffering is how God is accomplishing his purposes. His purpose is to bring attention not to Paul, but to God. His purpose is of leading others to the knowledge of Jesus. And listen, church, being a follower of Jesus, it means that you are on the winning team. We read the end of the story and we see that Jesus is crowned as the victorious king. But to be in his kingdom, you have to surrender yourself over to God. Every day, is to take on the humble posture that Jesus had while he walked this earth. Not looking to your own glory, but to the glory of God. 
And then we come on Paul's second word picture of what it means to follow Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 14, we see that a follower of Jesus lets off the sweet smell of Christ. How do followers of Jesus smell it? This week as I was studying, I, I came to my mind the image of someone who got drunk the night before. And then they go out into the hot summer sun and they begin to sweat. They could smell the alcohol coming through their pores. When you get close to this person, you smell on the outside the things that they put on the inside. Listen, Christ is not here on this earth. But if you live for Jesus, you have him on the inside. And his smell should be coming from your pores. And all who come in contact with you should smell him on you. Let me ask you this morning, smell yourself. Do you smell like Jesus? When we read the stories of Jesus, do they resonate with your life? Do the actions throughout your day, the, the words of your mouth, your thoughts, do they show that you love the Lord your God with all that you are? Do the people that you hang out with look like the people that Jesus hung out with while he was here on this earth? Do you have the same attitude of Jesus? Being both firm in your beliefs, at the same time gracious to sinners. Do you daily get your hands dirty caring for the overlooked people around you? Do you smell like Jesus? And listen, the smell is more obvious, not through our success and our achievements, but in the heat of the day, our sufferings, our trials. And if you are a follower of Jesus, everyone should be able to smell the aroma of Jesus coming from them. This passage tells us those who smell. He says, for to God we are the fragrance of Christ. God, first and foremost, smells Jesus coming from us. God the Father is looking down from heaven. He sees the tears that you shed because you suffered for Christ. He sees people mocking you. He sees you denying your flesh. God our Father looks down and sees the loneliness that you feel in a world that is very different from you. You engage with people at your work, the park, the classroom. We're talking about things that are very different from the way of life that you live. God, our fathers in heaven, looking down on us as a church, <coughs> struggling with all we have to start a new congregation in a city that very much needs one. God looks down on these things, he takes a big breath. He smells the sweet fragrance. He says, those people, they smell like the sun. Not only is it God who smells us, but everyone else around us should be smelling Jesus on us as well. How he continues, he says, among those are those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. There are some who smell Jesus on us with something that's beautiful, pleasing. For others, they're repulsed by the smell. How can one thing smell two different ways to, to two different people? One thing that comes to my mind is I love his family. We eat a lot of tacos in our house, at least once a week. Anytime we go out to dinner, mm -hmm. almost always the order tacos if they're on the menu. And we're good whether it's a corn tortilla or a flour tortilla, whether you put beef or pork or shrimp, different cheeses, different sauces. But there's one ingredient to my opinion 
that makes any taco complete, and that is cilantro. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got an amen out of you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and just recently I learned that uh, different people don't like cilantro, and it's not even their fault. Some people have this genetic variation in their olfactory receptors. It makes cilantro taste stinky to them. Some of the things I was reading, people would say that it tastes like soup, or even some said it tastes like body odor. And I was reading that, that some of the scientists that have studied this, they estimate it's about 20% of the world's population have this genetic variation, particularly those in European and Asian contexts. And so while the majority of us think that cilantro completes any taco that you might eat, there's 20% of people who can't stand it. And they're not being picky, they can't help it. Listen, as followers of Jesus to some, we are the aroma of death leading to death. But to others, we are an aroma of life leading to life. There are some who smell Jesus coming through our doors, and it leads them to life. Say, hey, I want what you have. I'm lacking purpose and joy and hope and forgiveness. Please tell me about your Jesus. But there's others who sense Jesus on us. You know, you're such an idiot. You're full of believing those myths. You're holding to traditions that don't work in our modern culture. Some, we have a smell of death leading to death. For these people, they have a genetic variation, if you will, that makes them unable to smell the sweet fragrance that we smell. Their eyes are veiled, as we will see in Chapter 3. And this veil causes them to reject Jesus and it ultimately leads to their condemnation. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, Paul says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it's the power of God to those who are being saved. You very easily think about an example of this from uh, our summary here in our community. So a few weeks ago, we were out on Greenfield Avenue on rush hour traffic, and we were handing out water bottles to commuters. We were handing them a water bottle, and we were handing them also an invitation to come to our church. It's the very same act that we were doing there. It was Jose out of town this morning, but on that day, he received a bottle of water, and he received a car. That Sunday, he showed up to worship with us. He pulled out his card out of his pocket that showed me the invitation of Angela Kennedy. But on that hot sunny day, there was also this man who was stopped in the middle of Greenfield Avenue. He rolled down his window and he screamed at us, cussed us out. He said, F you Christians, get the F out of my neighborhood. For Jose, he smelled Jesus' eyes. To him, it smelled like life. He was attracted to it. For this man, he smelled Jesus upon us, and he was repulsed by it. It offended him. These are very heavy realities. The life that we live, the words that we say, they could change someone's life, but also bend them to the point of eternal condemnation. And here's what Paul writes. He says, who is adequate for these things? Who is sufficient to deal with this responsibility? And this is Paul's answer to that question. He says, for we do not market the word of God for profit like so many. The word market might be translated in your English translation as peddle. 
comes to the image. You go to the strip district, and someone's setting up a table there along the sidewalk, peddling some fake jewelry to people, trying to make a quick profit. Think about someone coming by and getting one of these fake watches that this guy is selling. You might get really excited at first. Man, I got a deal from this guy down in the strip this year. And then you fast forward a, a month and the first time this gold watch gets scratched, you see the gold paint come off. You realize that there's nothing of value underneath. Six months later, this watch isn't even working at all. Paul says this is not how we should handle the gospel. Unfortunately, there are some people that are hustlers in the church. They're giving people a false gospel for personal gain. Paul says this is not us. We try to speak about our King, Jesus Christ, with sincerity. From God and in front of God. Listen, churches, we go out as the alone of Christ. Don't offer someone a version of following Jesus that looks shiny on the outside, but is completely lacking in any eternal value. And as we close, I want to turn it to you. Turn these word pictures to your life. Knowing that following Jesus brings triumph and defeat, attraction and repulsion. I want to ask you the question, will you follow Jesus? Will you still follow Jesus? Even if it means that you are defeated and others are repulsed by you. Will you walk through this world as a captive on your way to your own death? Listen, Jesus did not promise to us a life of ease, no life of comfort. Jesus used the words, he says, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, his instrument of death, and follow me calls on us to lose our life for his sake. Jesus also promised in that very same sense that if we lose our life for his sake, that we will gain it. That we will be in his celebration parade, in his eternal kingdom. Let me ask you another question, Lord. Will you be Jesus to the world around you, even if it means that you will be hated for it? Jesus told his disciples, he says, don't be surprised when you're persecuted. He says, if they hated me, then they're going to hate you too. Persecution is hard. There are many Christians throughout history that have been killed because they smell like Jesus. The Bible also promises that if we live for Jesus in front of the world, that there are some who will receive his words. There are some who, oh, what's that strange smell? I don't recognize it, but I kind of like it. And we'll ask the question to you why you smell the way that you do. You can introduce them to Jesus Christ again. In turn, and introduce them to life. Listen, I hope that this lesson it encourages you in the faith to go out from this place as the aroma of Christ, bringing glory to God, the victorious general, pointing people to salvation in Jesus. Also, his truths prepare you for the hard realities that following Jesus will bring. The suffering, the rejection. Today, if you are hearing these positive and negative things about following Jesus for the very first time, 
I want to ask you, will you follow Jesus? You follow Jesus in, in baptism, showing that you yourself have died with Christ, that the old you has been buried and you have been raised with Christ to a new life. If you've already committed to following Jesus, will you persevere in following Jesus? Take on the attitude of of Paul, saying, thanks be to God, even for these hard things in my life, knowing that they are bringing glory to your God, knowing that they are producing Christ's likeness in you, knowing that they are pointing others to their salvation. Thanks for listening to this teaching today. If you'd like to take the next step in following Jesus with the church at Mon River, we invite you to go to atmonriver.com and click on the button that says connect with us. May God bless you with the grace and peace of Jesus Christ, our Lord.